möte är satt. What is the status of LGBT rights in the world today? According to Amnesty International, same-sex intercourse is prohibited in 76 countries and can in worst case be punished by death. On a daily basis, LGBT people all around the world are facing numerous ways of discrimination and violation of the human rights. How is, L Sorry. How is everyday life for persecuted LGBT people? What do you risk by coming out? Today, we are joined by Patricia Cady, a political advisor in Amnesty International. She will talk about LGBT's rights in Eastern Europe. Sabrina Ramey will attend this meeting to talk about the campaign against transsexual people in the United States. She is a professor in political science at NTNU. The Canadian ambassador to Norway, Arthur Wilczynski, will talk about his own experience as an openly gay married man in an official office. My name is Tala, and I will lead tonight's meeting. And my name is Kristaver, and I will be the secretary of this meeting. The rest of this point will be in Norwegian. Fra styrets protokoll har vi følgende å melde. Styret har vedtatt uh, at samfunnets orkester ved Kjellerbenne får medhold i innstillingen om å ta opp et gjengmedlem uten medlemsrett på studenter som funnet i Trondheim. Dette med hjemmelig i studenter som funnet lova, paragraf 22, tredje ledd som lyd. Etter innstilling fra gjengenes representant i Finansstyret, kan styret i særskilte tilfeller samtykke til valg av nye gjengmedlemmer uten medlemsrett til studenter som funnet. Videre har styret følgende forslag til dagsorden. Punkt 1. Møte er satt. Punkt 2. Styreprotokoll. Punkt 3. Politisk fem minutt. Punkt 4. Inledning ved Patricia Katie. Punkt 5. Inledning ved Sabrina Ramé. Punkt 6. Inledning ved Arthur Wilczynski. Punkt 7. Kunstnerisk innslag ved Pikestrøm. Punkt 8. Pause. Punkt 9. Sofaprat. Punkt 10. Sofaprat med spørsmål fra salen. Punkt 11. Eventuelt. Punkt 12. Kritikk av møte. Og punkt 13. Møte er hevet. Kan Storsalen godkjenne dagsorden slik den foreligger ved akklamasjon? Tusen takk. We're now moving on to point three. Five minutes of politics. Do anyone have something to say here? Uh, we request speakers to honor the five minutes and other speakers. And you are welcome to speak in either Norwegian or English. I'm the Storsal. I'm Eivin, and I'm a member. And uh, first of all, congratulations, friend, with pride. And it is, and it has become a celebration that is joined by thousands of Norwegians every year. However, pride is not all about celebrating the freedoms, the that we have been given, or actually we haven't been given them, we have fought for them. And that is really important to remember. Nothing is given, nothing is granted. It is a continuous struggle, and we see the incidents with the neo-Nazi demonstrations, like the, the one we had in Christian Sun earlier this summer, that we need to be on the alert and we need to stay focused so we can promote the importance of human dignity, of everybody's right to love the person he or she wants to love. We need to go out in the streets and we need also to address all the bystanders the people that are looking on the parades and not joining. I would say they is a part of the problem. The ignorance is actually a problem in society and we need to address it. If we want a society where we can fight against homophobia, against transphobia, we need to address the people that stay and look at the parades and not joining. There is all here, I'm 
certain has somebody to go for, somebody that maybe not dare to go out in the street and be open. And we need all to go for somebody. And I think, and I would say to you, go out, go for no one, is the slogan that free the Norwegian LGBT organization has lifted on the agenda for all the prides in Norway this summer. And I think that it's really important that we are listening to that message. Go for my, go out in the streets and take a point and stand for something that is the important thing we can do to actually fight against the ones who believes in the conspiracy theories, the ones that are marching against the homo lobby. And remember, in Trøndersk we have a word, etno kjem til seg selv. And that is really important to remind in these days. Thank you everybody, and I'm looking forward to see you this next week on different uh, um, events we have during the Pride Festival. Keep strong. As we don't seem to have any more speakers at this point, we're now ready to move on to point four. Introduction by Patricia Katie. Please give her a warm welcome. Thank you very much and congratulations with uh, another Pride Week. International solidarity is really important when we work for the rights of lesbian, gay, bisexual, sexual, transgender and intersex people in the world. And what we never ever should forget is that the rights, the human rights for any group of people that we have achieved can easily be taken away again. And especially, as we have seen, the rights for sexual and gender minorities. We need to keep in mind that we have to fight for them, we have to defend them, and we have to do it every day, and we have to do it as allies and as partners um, uh, all the time, never forget it. Uh, I've been asked to speak about the situation in Chechnya, and I heard in the introduction that I have been asked to speak about Eastern, Eastern Europe. I try to do both, but I will focus on the situation in Chechnya. As most of you will know, um, in the beginning of April, uh, a journalist in the Russian newspaper, uh, Novaya Gazeta, came out with a huge and very well-founded article about the fact that more than 100 gay or alleged gay people in Chechnya had been um, uh, incarcerated, had been tortured, and that some of them had been killed. And this solely because of their uh, sexual orientation or because of their alleged sexual orientation. It was a uh, it was a campaign. It was it was an orchestrated campaign. It was it was systematic. Um, uh, gay people or alleged gay people were targeted. They were taken in by military and police officers. They were taken not to concentration camps, as it has been mentioned in the media, but to unofficial prisons, as Amnesty International called them, which means they would they could be uh, police cellars in police station or uh, military camps, abandoned military camps from the times of the uh, First and Second Chechnya War. Gay men, an alleged gay man, would be incarcerated here, here. They would be humiliated, they would be victims to horrible torture. One of the examples that has been cited is uh, uh, a man who got a pipe in his anus they put barbed wire in the anus, removed the pipe, and then slowly drew out the barbed wire. And this was filmed, and this film was shown to those people who were held incarcerated in these camps, in these abandoned military camps in the police stations. People were incarcerated for two weeks, three weeks, maybe a month. 
The amazing thing that happened when this uh, was published by the Novaya Gazeta and a very courageous uh, journalist, uh, Elena Milashina, was the fact that the spokesperson of um, the leader of the Chechen Republic, Kadyrov, said that we do not have gay people in this republic. This is not happening because we do not have gay people in the Chechen Republic. And should we have gay people people in the Chechen Republic, their families know how to deal with them. And that is, a, uh, that is um, the same as to say that they should be killed in uh, a so-called honor killing, because being gay is such a shame to the family that the family should um, kill the person to get rid of the shame. And similar statements were made by other officials in the Chechen Republic. And uh, this also has uh, later on um, be, re be repeated by the, by the leader of the Chechen Republic, President Kadyrov, who has said that we do not have gay people in the Republic. This is a lie. This is not happening. This is just being told uh, to, uh, to make Chechnya look, um, uh, to talk badly about Chechnya and to, uh, to, to blemish our honor. The situation for very many people in the Chechnya Republic was dangerous. Uh, because they were at risk because of their sexual orientation or their alleged sexual orientation. The Russian LGBT network got contact with approximately 130 people. They managed to get 70 people out of the Chechen Republic. 43 of them have been uh, given asylum in other countries, countries like France, countries like Germany, countries like Canada. Um, there are few people who have come to Norway, and we also hope that the Norwegian government is um, aware about the obligation they have to give, to give people uh, at risk for, of persecution because of their sexual orientation asylum, and we hope that they will step up more in this uh, manner. What also seriously concerns Amnesty International is the fact that the brave, brave journalist who wrote about the persecution of uh, uh, gay or alleged gay people in, in Chechnya received um, serious threats to her life. So she had to flee the country. She has been living on and off abroad. And uh, I spoke with her last week because she visited last, uh, Oslo last week and she said, I can't uh, go back to Chechnya, my life would be at risk. And that also means that um, the probability to get more uh, information about what is going on in the, in the Chechen Republic uh, is lesser because the journalists do not dare to return because they fear for their life. So, the uh, Chechnya is part of the Russia Federation. Russia, in principle, should take responsibility for what is happening in, uh, in the Chechen Republic. What we see is that uh, President Putin is very reluctant to do anything that can disturb the relation he has with uh, Kadyrov, the leader of the Chechen Republic, has uh, um, for many years, for the last 10 years, for all those years he has been in, in power, uh, being responsible for a broad range of human rights abuses, and he has never, ever been held accountable by the president of the Russian Federation. So also this horrible persecution of um, gay people is happening with uh, a complete lack of investigation with a complete lack of holding uh, the leader of the Chechen Republic to account. 
Amnesty has, for many years, been working on the human rights abuses in the Chechen Re Republic. One of the challenges is the issue um, related to what is called shared responsibility, where uh, a person who is doing something that is being seen as a criminal act or, uh, or, or an, an unwanted act, uh, the family of that person would also be attacked. For many years, those who belonged uh, to the families of people who were suspected to be um, uh, uh, separatists uh, have been attacked. So the mothers, the fathers, the brothers, the sisters, the cousins, the uncles, the aunts of a person who was suspected to be a separatist uh, were prosecuted. And what we see is that the same kind of me uh, methods are now used towards the families of those who are gay or, or those who are perceived to be gay. So many of the families will also be um, in danger. And nothing is going to change until President Putin puts his uh, foot down and um, ask or demands that Kadiro follows uh, the rules uh, of the country. We can also say that um, Russia is not a country where respect for the human rights of gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and intersex people are respected. But we have not seen any kind of persecution as what we now see in the Chechen Republic, and we are um, really concerned about the fact that it is going on without any kind of intervention or interference by uh, the president. Nevertheless, we have seen in many other uh, situations that what is helping is international pressure. And what already has been helpful is the fact that, um, uh, okay, I just finish, is the fact that so many people have uh, been engaged and been involved, that so many uh, state leaders, that so many activists have signed onto letters. So, so we hope that this in the end will have an effect and um, give people, um, sexual minorities, gender minorities in the Chechen Republi Republic, some protection, better protection. At the present, the situation looks really dark. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. The next speaker is Sabrina Rame. Please give her a warm welcome. I realized, oh, first of all, well, welcome uh, to, to this event. Uh, uh, congratulations on uh, holding the, the, the celebration of gay and lesbian and trans rights, transgender rights. Uh, it's an honor to be uh, speaking to you tonight. I'm very grateful for this invitation. I realized some time ago that uh, there's a lot of insanity in the world. You all know this. Uh, we have uh, Trump and Kim Jong-un Un uh, playing nuclear brinkmanship. We have uh, Trump pulling out of the Paris uh, Climate Accord and uh, dismantling environmental protections in the USA, and, and this could be multiplied. Uh, for tonight, I want to talk to you about the so-called transgender bathroom uh, initiatives in the United States. Uh, even here, there's an element of insanity. Uh, uh, I was born in, in, in London, uh, came to the USA at age 10, Austrian mother, Spanish father, and had lived almost half of my life in Europe, not only in England initially and Norway more recently, but also in Austria, Germany, uh, Serbia, and uh, four months in Croatia. Croatia was the shortest period. Uh, so I, I'm as much a European as an American. I'm, uh, I'm both. Uh, Euro-American, Americanized European, you, you, you take your pick. And that means that uh, uh, for me to look at some American ideas and expressions, uh, it is maybe easier than for 
uh, a lot of Americans to, to see the disjunction between what's said and what's meant. And here I'm thinking, of course, of the, the use of the word bathroom. Now, bathroom, you got the word bath and you got the word room. So obviously it's a room and inside it's a bath. Oh, except that's not the case in the United States. Bathroom is usually, the word is usually used to mean a room without a bath. Oh, uh, well, uh, toilet. Uh, and why is that? Oh, we can't talk about toilets. Oh, no, urination, defecation. Oh, we can't talk about that. No, 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 forbut, forbut. And so this is the starting point. Remember, America was among the earliest people to come to America with Puritans, uh, and there's still the, the sort of uh, legacy of that. So transgender bathroom initiatives. Ah, uh, some paranoia developed, that, uh, which I, uh, I will turn to momentarily. But in North Carolina, there was a law passed, uh, I think, 2016, to say that uh, transgender people needed to, anybody needed to use the, the toilet, uh, the public toilet, corresponding to the gender, see the word gender, ah, we'll get back to that later, uh, corresponding to the gender on their respective birth certificates. Excellent idea, just, this is the best. Uh, hardly heard of any better ideas in all of my life than that. Um, that, that law, uh, what happened is a lot of major businesses started to say, well, and sports, star, uh, sports uh, organizations, four minutes used or four minutes left? Scheiße. Das ist ganz unmöglich. Ich habe, habe nur die erste, erste Hälfte meiner ersten Seite uh, benutzt. Okay. It's been vetoed in South Dakota, such a bill. Uh, it it, it uh, has been stalled in Texas. There have been initiatives trying to do this in Washington State, Virginia, Michigan. So how does it work? How would, would, should this work? It should work like this, that you post a guard, armed guard, in front of every toilet. And before anyone wants to come in, show your birth certificate, comrade, or you don't get to pee. But of course, it doesn't work like that. Uh, and bear in mind, too, that while uh, those going from male to female sometimes look like maybe they were originally male, those going from female to male never look that way. They look completely, totally male and often sport beards. And so under this law, you'd have bearded men going into, into the women's restrooms, no doubt showing their birth certificate. Okay, uh, skipping very quickly. The United States has a whole history of panics about all and, and, and phobia about, phobias about all kinds of groups. The Puritans didn't like those who were non-Puritan. Uh, the blacks, of course, came in as slaves. There was a Civil Rights Act, 1867, which granted citizenship to everybody born in the USA except the American Indians. Uh, Catholics were targeted by so-called Native Americans. Uh, Native Americans were not originally, it was not a name applied to American Indians. Uh, gays and lesbians, obviously, and transgender, too. What do trans transphobes claim? They claim that trans transgender men are really women, that transgender women are really men. Uh, and of course, uh, they further claim that those going from male to female want to prey on women. But they never say the other way around, that those who go from female to male are going into the men's restrooms in order to prey on the men. So there's, there's a sort of fundamental disconnect. Response number one, if we're really talking about places which are dangerous for women, mm, uh, and, and, and I, I know I get, in the United States, when I go into a public parking lot, uh, I'm like hyper alert, hyper alert. Because in, in a, a public parking lot, if it's like evening, if you're alone in there, if it's dark, uh, a woman can be, and for that matter, even in maybe a man, can be threatened by what? Other men or, or men. Men in the ages of 18 to 35, regardless, regardless of race. And in that event, if you really want to protect women in public parking lots, there should be a law banning any men from going into any parking lots, public parking lots in the United States ever. Because they don't get into that. Why not? Ah, because they're crazy, you see? They don't think logically. One minute left, forget it. Uh, I'm going to skip some stuff. Second claim. I'd I like to get through my five claims. I've got five claims made. Uh, uh, okay, second claim, the Bible doesn't allow it. Uh, Reverend Tim Butterfield, God made us with a purpose. To change that purpose or identity is to say to God, I don't like what you made me. 
This assumes that God is up there, like an old man in the sky. He says, I'm going to create Michael, male. Michael must stay male. I'm very interested in what Michael does. And then surely I make her female. She must stay female. There's no God like that. Come on. You can believe in God. You cannot believe in God. But please don't have crazy ideas that there's this old man in the sky who's got something invested in your gender. This is crazy. Um, Louisiana. Oh, I love this case. In Louisiana, uh, Republican state lawmakers said, quote, we don't know what gender identity is, unquote. Well, there are books. I can recommend a book written by James D. Weinrich, Sexual Landscapes. I will finish soon. <laughs> I'm very good at finishing soon. This is actually the shortest lecture I've presented in my life so far. <laughs> Sexual landscapes, why we are what we are, why we love whom we love. Uh, and I would like to explain the core ideas in, the, in this book, very interesting. Weinrich distinguishes among gender identity, and that's where the, you, know, you wake up in the morning and you say, I'm a woman, huh? or I'm a man. Maybe you don't say it explicitly. But if you're transgender, you wake up, you say, I'm a woman, then you look at your body and you say, oh shit, you know, like, how did this happen? Um, sexual attraction, that's separate. And then there's gender-associated behavior. Uh, gender-associated behavior. This is a third thing. And uh, it's rare for somebody to be inverted on even, even two, or let alone all three of these. Typically, you're inverted on one of these. Uh, you have a transgender issue, or you're gay or lesbian, or, uh, or, or you could be transvestites, typically male, male Transvestites, dressing female, typically attracted to women and consider, consider themselves men. Um, and then there's a, this fake idea that, that some Christian parents have that their children are scared of transgendered classmates. This is false. Ross? Uh, I didn't hear the response. Maybe it wasn't uh, intended for me. Okay. Transphobes uh, also claim sometimes that crossing over is a choice, not a necessity. Uh, and I give you a couple of definitions from the Merriam Webster di di Online Dictionary. Transgenderism is a response to gender dysphoria, defined by Merriam Webster as a distressed state arising from conflict between a person's gender identity and the sex the person has or was identified as having at birth. And gender identity is defined in the same dictionary as a person's internal sense of being male, female, or some combination of male and female, or neither male nor female. Uh, I, I will say, when I saw that in a dictionary, I was a little surprised. Um, in, uh, in conclusion, it's a real conclusion, yes. Ooh. Uh, the National Center for Transgender Equality conducted a survey among transgender persons in 2015, the most recent I could find online, found that 46% of transgendered respondents had been verbally harassed during the previous 12 months. 9% had been physically attacked because of their uh, transgendered, being transgendered. 10% had been sexually assaulted. Uh, and uh, during the uh, previous year, also 10, uh, uh, 27 transgendered persons uh, were killed in the USA in 2016. And I close with a quotation from Sheriff Leon Lott of Richland County, South Carolina. In the 41 years I've been in law enforcement in South Carolina, I've never heard of a transgender person attacking or otherwise battering someone in a restroom. This is a non-issue. Thank you, comrades, for listening to my little talk and for allowing me to go a little bit over time. You are very sweet people. Thank you so much, Sabrina. We're now ready for our next speaker. Please welcome Arthur Wilsinski. Hi, everyone. How are y'all doing? Good? Great. Um, I was trying to figure out how do I follow that speech, my god. But I looked up, 
and I saw that we were under in the big top. Uh, so I'll, I'll try and, and, and keep the entertainment going because I thought that was a fantastic discussion about the importance of, of, uh, of perspective and transgender issues. And I thought that I'd share a little bit about my, my own experience because I think that that's what, what, uh, what folks want me to do. And I, I promise I will be short uh, because I think that what we really look forward to is a discussion with, uh, with all of you. So uh, again, my name is Arthur Wilczynski. I am Canada's ambassador uh, to Norway, and I am a gay man here with my husband. So it, it, I have to say how, how privileged I am to be here. And I also want to tell you that that's actually a fairly rare thing around the world, is to have the ability uh, to come to a country and to be there with your same-sex partner. There are few countries that actually allow it. You'd be actually quite surprised how few uh, are, are that open. Uh, and uh, it's one of the reasons why I'm really, really grateful to be here in Norway. But I want to give you a little bit of my, my background. So first I, I'll say that I am a very privileged person. Uh, first of all, because I am male. Second of all, because I am white. This gives me all kinds of privilege in the world and allows me to, uh, to exercise that privilege in a way that I think is, is unfair. And it gives me an, a, a perspective that I need to be responsible uh, for people who do not share, uh, share that privilege. But there are aspects of my, my identity that I think are, 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 are relevant. So first of all, I was born in Poland. Uh, I am the, the son of Holocaust survivors. We were kicked out of Poland when I was uh, two and a half years old. In 1968, the then communist regime launched an anti-Semitic purge and basically forced the rest of the Jewish community in Poland out. And my family were, um, were refugees, it, first in Europe, and we were eventually accepted in, uh, to Canada. And we were sponsored by family that came to, uh, uh, to Canada before the, the Second World War. And uh, my parents, because they were raised by committed communists, decided that the best thing for them to do was to put me in an orthodox religious school, um, which I could tell you did not go so well. Um, there's nothing quite uh, like growing up when you're you know, nine, ten years old, when you realize that you're different, when you have a crush on the boy in the class, but when you look up at the teacher and they're telling you that people with feelings like you uh, should die, that has a, an impact on your self-esteem. Um, and it, it, it's something that I think that, that has affected me over, over the course of my life. On the one hand, I think it's made me independent, but on the other hand, it's made me realize the importance of alliances and friends and the importance of building bridges to those people and, and have understanding with those organizations and institutions that might not share the same perspective as I do. And this has been something that's been uh, common throughout my, 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 my coming out and my, my adult life. Um, throughout high school, I was completely closeted. I had no references in, uh, in, our, uh, in our either television or, or there was no role models for someone like me when I was, when I was growing up in the, in the 1970s. Uh, and uh, I, I was basically closeted until uh, I left Montreal, which is where I grew up, which is one of the most progressive cities in North America, and moved to a small town called Kitchener-Waterloo, which was one of the most socially conservative cities uh, in, in Canada but it was away from home. I needed to break that bond with home in order to find the comfort uh, and the safety uh, to, be, to, to come out. And it was in a place like this that I, that I came out. And that's why, for me, it's such an honor to be here. It was actually uh, the student union of the University of Waterloo, where I went to school, that created the safe space for me uh, to come out. Uh, perfect strangers who didn't know me at the Gay and Lesbian uh, of, of, of Waterloo, GLOBE. Back then we had a much shorter uh, acronym than the e equality one that is very, very inclusive today. Um, it was, um, but it was, it was being able to reach out to perfect strangers uh, that helped me uh, transition uh, into an, uh, my, my perspective of being out. It helped me make all kinds of other life choices because I felt supported by, by people and organizations, by allies that helped me come out through that process. And it even helped me change my, my, my university uh, emphasis. When I, when I first came to, to school at Waterloo, uh, I was following in the footsteps of my parents. My mother was a biochemist. My dad was a chemical engineer. Of course, I was supposed to be the Jewish son who was the doctor in the family. So I was in biochemistry. And it just 
didn't fit. I have to say that when I was at university in, in, in places like this, we had a, it wasn't quite as fancy as this, it wasn't quite as, as uh, has the same history, but we had a place called Federation Hall at the University of, uh, of Waterloo. And I spent a lot of time partying there. Let me tell you, if you're repressed through all of high school and then go away from school, there are things that you do that are lubricated by beer, and I see some of those on your tables today, that uh, you know might not uh, be so proud of years down, uh, down the road. But that being said, it helped me get the courage to say that it was okay to change. And uh, I decided that, that, uh, that biochemistry was not right for me, and uh, that I was gonna change into political science. And so I decided on a trip home to Montreal that I was going to do two things to my mother. Uh, one, uh, I was going to, to tell her uh, that I was gay. And secondly, that I was going to say, Mom, I'm dropping out of science. So when I did this, silence. She looks at me. You're dropping out of science? <laughs> What are you going to do? And I'll tell you, like, she's met my husband. I've been with my husband for 30 years, and the two of them are just a little bit too much alike for, for comfort. But uh, it, it wasn't until um, I became ambassador to Norway that she realized that the choice that I had made uh, was the right one. Until then, she didn't understand what the hell I did. But now, she, you know, ambassador to that, she understands. Um, but the, the, the point of all this is that we needed allies. We need people to help us move through the system, to make things get better at the institutional level. And in Canada this year, one of the most historic things happened. In addition to our Prime Minister, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, marching in pride parades, which he's done, I think, in every major city in, 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 the, in the country, we had, in, in our national capital, we had the chief of our defense staff, we had the head of our security and intelligence service. We had representatives of our national police forces. Institutions and organizations that less than a generation ago were dedicated to our persecution. They were in the parade marching because they wanted to see people like me in their organizations. They wanted to see people like us uh, succeed. And I think that those kinds of alliances, the ones that, that sometimes are the least comfortable and the ones that sometimes are the most challenging are the ones that we need to nurture if we're gonna preserve those fragile rights that we have gained. It's in my lifetime that we have moved from decriminalization of homosexuality in Canada to the uh, inclusion of sexual orientation as a prohibited grounds of discrimination in our human rights code to marriage equality to this year, the inclusion of specific references to the elimination of discrimination on the basis of gender identity and gender expression in our human rights code. This is very recent, this is fragile, and events such as pride and gatherings such as this with you all here today remind us that we need to continue the fight, we need to continue to push the struggle forward because as, as was said earlier, there are many in countries like Canada and Norway and in other places such as Chechnya and other countries that would work day and night to subvert our rights. This is not the end of a struggle, this isn't only about a party, this is about coordination and working together to ensure that the human rights of all human beings, regardless of their sexual orientation, regardless of their gender identity, where they're born, all of us fit under the Universal Declaration of Human Beings. We are born free and equal in dignity and rights, and it's up to everyone in this room and out there to fight for that every single day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arthur. We can't wait to hear more from all of our three speakers after the break. But before we take a 10 minutes break, we'll have a performance by the girl choir from Emil. So please welcome Pikeström.
Dear Storsal, we, uh, we are Pikestrøm from the study program Energy and Environmental Engineering at Kløshavn. It's a great honor for us to be here today on this very special occasion, celebrating diversity, equality, and most importantly, love. Love is a feeling of equal worth, no matter gender or sexuality, and even if it's just for one night or for the rest of your life. And I think that most people who have ever been in love before can identify with the next song, Pikstrøm sings, Hunt i hjertet. Yeah. 
Thank you so much, Pikiström. We're now ready for a 10 minute break and we'll continue again at 10 past eight.
come to me. Can storsalen fall to ro? Can the audience please settle down? Thank you. <laughs> We're now ready to start on point nine, chat with the speakers. Patricia, Sabrina, Arthur will now join Inga in our couch. We will sooner open the uh, questions from the audience. So if you do have any questions, you can write yourself up on the list by Dag Gauden, which is in by the podium. You're welcome. Thank you for being with us here today. Uh, during your introductions, we've heard that the situation for LGBT people varies a lot around the world. Can you say anything about what the forces are that either encourages or restrains the rights of these people? If I could start? Yes. Um, I used to work with the people in the Baltic countries, the LGBT organizations in the Baltic countries. Uh, on security issues around the Baltic Pride. And uh, in 2010, which was the first year I'd, I attended the Baltic Pride in the city of Vilnius in Lithuania, um, what I saw was that we were 500 people who were to march in the Pride and there were 3,000 counter demonstrators. And they belonged to three very different groups. They were religious people, who thought that um, uh, sexual and gender minorities basically were uh, against the order of God or committing a sin. And then there were the people who were concerned about family values. And in many senses, their arguments were really vile because they presented gay people as being pedophiles and endangering the security of children. And then you had the ultra-right movement, who were the most scary ones, because they were there um, with the uh, banners um, and the boots, and they were um, really threatening, and they were physically posing the biggest threat. So I think that these are the three different forces that we have, and they have very different, actually, uh, narratives uh, to counter the basic human rights of lesbian, gay, transgender, and intersex people. I'd try and, and look at it from a positive perspective. I think there's also a lot of, of pressure out there to include and to uh, counter discrimination. I think that over the past number of years, the number of countries that have decriminalized homosexuality uh, is significant. I think that international pressure and work by, by, uh, by countries such as Norway, Canada, uh, others uh, in Latin America, Chile, uh, makes a, a really big difference. Um, I was talking about being in the, in, the, in the Pride Parade in 1994 in New York. It was a march on, on, on the UN. And at the time, there was absolutely no action on the part of the United Nations around, around uh, dealing with sexual orientation or uh, gender identity or intersex issues. And today, uh, we actually have free and equal, uh, a UN program specifically designed to address uh, LGBT uh, issues around the world. We have a, a, a special uh, a representative uh, who also is, is there to press countries. So I think there is, there is pressure, and, and I think the biggest pressure that exists uh, are individuals who have the courage to come out, who have the courage to, despite the, the, the challenges in, the, in their own countries, uh, the challenges within their own, uh, their own cultures and communities, within their own families to come out. Those are the strongest forces for change. And I, I think we don't have to look too far to see that we've done that in Norway, We've done that in Canada, and I think that we can do it uh, elsewhere in the world. I can add something too. Uh, uh, from my perspective, one of the biggest obstacles to progress, and, and there has been progress, as uh, other has just uh, pointed out, but one of the biggest obstacles uh, it comes from the conservative wings of monotheist religions. And uh, I think it's fair to say that Christian religion uh, Jewish religion and Islamic religion all have within them uh, conservative wings 
in, in Islam, of course, ISIS uh, uh, is, of course, so far on the intolerant edge that uh, extreme that uh, it, it m makes most, if not all of us, shudder. Uh, <clears throat> the, the thing about the conservatives within, uh, and they're liberals uh, in, in these religions too, who are, who are tolerant, we have to keep that in mind. Uh, in, also among Muslims, there are, there are, are tolerant, tolerant Muslims, obviously tolerant Jews, obviously tolerant Christians, but the conservatives, or if you prefer orthodox, orthodox not in the official sense, but in terms of very orthodox, very old, extremely old-fashioned views, they take their readings of, of scriptures which were written 3,000 or plus or minus years ago, and they say, well, according to my reading of this or my pastor's reading, homosexuality is wrong, you can't change your gender, and then you get this interesting leap, uh, which is to say that uh, killing, uh, uh, killing a, uh, and Patricia made this point, that somehow killing a person uh, can have merit uh, versus tolerance and allowing the person to live. And this comes out of religion. And in order to combat homophobia and transphobia effectively, uh, we need to have a, a big reformation, not just the one from the 16th century, but a big reformation where all the monotheist religions open up and start to say, hey, sexual minorities are okay. What's the problem? Uh, now, with uh, Trump's ban on transgender people in the army, uh, I want to ask you, are you afraid that the achievement of the LGBT community will be reversed? That question is to me, I guess. Um, well, th th there is a battle. There's already been some, some reversal. He rescinded uh, 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 an executive order from Obama uh, protecting gays and lesbians. But one of the things I was not able to get to, get to was I, I brought along a, an article from the New York Times, which showed the individual uh, maps of the United States and wh which states had protections and which ones didn't. And of the 50 states, the only one, the only one which has protections across the board for everything you can imagine is California. It's the only one. Other states can be pretty good. Washington State, Oregon, Nevada, Illinois, the New England states, New Mexico. I like New Mexico because it's a, it's a, uh, uh, there's a lot going on there. Where else do you have people uh, worshiping extraterrestrials? Uh, or, or have, have a, a town with the name Truth or Consequences. Uh, but along with that, you've also got a pretty, pretty tolerant population. Uh, so I say hurrah for New Mexico. Are there any chance that we will see similar setbacks other places in the world? I actually do think there's a risk. That's why I said we have to be vigilant and we can't take uh, our, the rights that we have gained for granted. I mean, uh, in, in, in Canada, uh, again, we have a very strong uh, government right now that is pressing uh, equality rights, uh, and in particular on, on for transgender issues and people who have different gender expressions. Uh, but there are uh, elements within, within our country that, that, that are pushing back against that. And uh, again, I think it's why it's important in, in, in countries that have already made some progress for individuals to continue to make the point to continue to strive, strive for it, but there, there is a risk. And uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm particularly concerned in, um, in, in places like Russia uh, that, have, uh, that have backslid particularly over the past number of years. I'm perhaps less concerned with the, with the United States than, than maybe some others uh, are. I think there's more, as you pointed out, to the United States than the, than the, uh, the president and the executive wing. And I think that, uh, that we will we will see uh, more progress moving forward. Yeah, we, we see we see retracting. We see it in countries in Africa who have had laws from colonial times um, that criminalized uh, homosexual behavior, but these laws might have been dormant laws. And now we can see that in several countries, like for example Uganda, these laws are revived and these laws are tightened. And as Arthur mentioned, the situation in, in Russia, where you had the law that the anti-propaganda law, so-called, which pro prohibits um, uh, positive mentioning of homosexuality 
towards minors, and also what we see in, in, in Russia is uh, a law which makes it really, really hard for LGBT organizations to work, um, uh, which is called the foreign agent law. Um, and we see that this law is targeting all uh, non-governmental organizations, but that it's particularly used to target LGBT organization, organizations in Russia. And uh, what is happening in Russia, in, in a sense, also spreads over to other countries. It is contagious. So countries like Ukraine, like Lithuania, uh, like Georgia, is looking at what is happening in Russia and is repeating um, the same kind of backtracking. So, as Arthur said uh, in his presentation, we need to be aware that the rights that we have achieved are fragile, and we need to defend them, all of us. We're now going to have some questions from the audience. Eric Scott can ask your question, while Mia Höghorn Björnbakken can get ready. Uh, where I go? <laughs> to the podium. Um, we'll also uh, mention that we now have five people on the question list and we wondered if Stu Schalm can accept that we close the question list after uh, the next questions has been asked. Okay. Um, I have a yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question about the transgender issues, um, particularly two things. Um, one, of course, I was very struck by the statistics about violence against transgender women in particular, um, and particularly among transgender women of color, uh, is still very ripe. And, uh, but my real question is economical opportunities, job openings, uh, opportunity for personal growth, not just with your sexuality, but also access to work, housing. Um, I wonder if I have any statistics um, about what that is nowadays here in the Western world. Um, so I just to like find out more about that. It's an issue that I've seen personally a lot among my friends, and uh, I want to know if that bears out in research. So I thought there were two questions. Oh. I, I had the question about economic opportunities and employment. And the second one has to do also with the transgender issue, particularly as I do with the minority issues. Uh, you said you have some statistics about murders, um, and uh, I can imagine that within our community. Uh, the black community in particular, it's a huge issue. And I wonder if you have any ideas and thoughts about that, how we either can rectify that situation, make it better, and improve the life and status of people, transgender people of color in particular, which is my main question right now. Uh, okay. Uh, looks like I have a chance to use this, uh, these charts. This is uh, from the New York Times a little while ago. Um, look at that map, that great. Um, the, uh, there are 20 states that don't have hate crime laws specifically protecting LGBT, uh, the LGBT community. There are 29 states that don't have laws prohibiting establishments and discriminating against LGBT customers. So that means that if you go into a cafe or your restaurant and, and you want to get seated to have a meal uh, in uh, s such states as Ohio, a surprise for me, uh, North Dakota, uh, Texas, Louisiana, in spite of that, that kind sheriff, uh, Florida, North Carolina, uh, the owner of, of the restaurant can say, get out of here, you look trans to, to me, or you look gay, so get out of my restaurant. Um, I, I'm surprised at such thing, but New Mexico is safe for that, you see, New Mexico. Mm. Okay, uh, 28 states do not have, and this is done out directly to the question, 28 states do not have non-discrimination uh, employment laws protecting members of uh, the sexual minorities. Uh, again, among those that do, Washington State, Oregon, California, Nevada, uh, Colorado is good. In fact, in all, all, all three of these, New Mexico, again, is good, Illinois, of course. Uh, Minnesota is good on all of these things. Also, Iowa, you wouldn't think. I mean, some of you may have seen that old film, The Music Man, uh, many years from many years ago with Robert Preston. Uh, you got trouble right here in River City with a capital um, P that stands for P, stands for pool that rhymes with 
I think I'm messing up the song. Uh, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, you got trouble right here in Mississippi with a capital T that rhymes with P that stands for pool. That's it. Uh, at any rate, uh, 28 states uh, allow discrimination in employment uh, against sexual minorities. Uh, so this, this is, is, is pretty serious. Uh, the route forward, get the Republicans out of office, put Democrats in, because by and large, uh, at this point in history, uh, the Democrats are advocating more tolerance than the Republicans. It wasn't always that way, interestingly enough, uh, but it has been for quite some time. Uh, in general, for, uh, uh, for transgender, transgender issue, uh, let's say going from male to female, uh, from what I, I've seen, I, I used to go to the support group meeting every Friday, and from what I saw, those who were crossing over early, uh, let it say 18, 20, 21, 22, uh, were typically attracted to men. Uh, uh, and those who were crossing over later, like at age 40 or, or later, were typically attracted to women. Uh, and it just took longer for them to figure out, you know, does this make any sense? But, um, and, and things don't have to make sense in order to, be, to have to be done. Uh, but if you, you know, for people to get their full training, you know, the, the late, uh, people, late, late transitioners uh, can get all their training and, and credentials and then economic opportunities are better. For those who cross over early at age 16, 18, no credentials, and suddenly they're transgender, that's much more complicated. That's much, much more, more complicated, obviously. Uh, and I think the other question was how to make this better. I think I answered that. Get the Republicans out of office, uh, get the Democrats in office, uh, and, and carry out the big reformation in, 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 the, in the churches. If, if I could just also take a uh, sure, shot, you asked the specific question also about transgender um, persons of color. And I think that there's a particular challenge there, and we, we, uh, we recognize that very much in, in the Canadian context as well, and I think that's one of the reasons why the, the government put in specific legislation around uh, gender expression and gender identity, but it's a, it is a huge problem. Uh, in Toronto this past summer, Black Lives uh, Matter, and last year as well, uh, highlighted the, uh, the plight of transgender persons of color and the continued interaction that they have, the negative interaction they have with, with police forces it's one of the reasons why uh, they, they, they protested very, very significantly and that there's still a lot of work to do. I think that uh, from an employment point of view, it's, it's also a challenge. And again, that's why I think the anti-discrimination legislation in the Canadian context that specifically addresses uh, transgendered persons and persons who have uh, different gender expressions uh, is important to prohibit that discrimination in the workplace. But there still is a, a significant social stigma. There's a lot of work to do. And I think by continuing to focus on where the problems are and where the problems are most pressing, and in the Canadian context, Indigenous people and persons of colour still face a, you know, double or multiple grounds of t discrimination that require a particular focus and emphasis. But this takes time and, and, and a concerted effort, not just legislation, but education, uh, both of the society at large, uh, but of various institutions around how do you accommodate people uh, who are going through transition in a way that they can participate effectively and fully uh, in the economic opportunities that a country like Canada could provide. Uh, like announced, we would like to close the speakers list now. Uh, it is still five people who want to ask questions. We'll also like to say that it's okay to ask questions in both Norwegian and English, and Inga will help translate it. So then we can take the next question from Mia Høghorn Bjørnbakken, and Eivind Rindal can start, get ready. I do want to stand up here, but um, <laughs> I just want to say I'm all for LGBT rights and I'm a heterosexual girl. And I just wanted to ask one question for Sabrina, really. And it's, uh, when did you first find out that you were a woman? And besides that, I just want to say I'm here today just standing up for you. And I will be at Saturday as well, next Saturday. 
and it's very important to me that every people is valued as equal. I just want to <laughs> be there for you all. So I'm here with my cousin, and she's the world to me. Um, I just want to stand up to you. Whatever race, whatever sexuality, I don't give a, you know, fuck. <laughs> I just want to ask <laughs> if that's okay. I'm well, just thank, curious. Thank you very much. You're a kind person. No, thank you so much. You too. <laughs> I'm going to leave now and just listen. <laughs> Sabrina, do you have a short comment to that or answer? Uh, sorry, I, I somehow wasn't hearing everything that was said. I was listening closely, but uh, sometimes my hearing isn't the best. Um, yeah, you know, it, it is. Some, you can get all kinds of stories about this. You know, I've read that some individual already knew by age four. That's pretty early. Um, uh, that uh, he or she, I don't remember what, the, what direction the person was going, uh, but uh, had a sense that the gender identity and the sexual parts didn't match. Um, that came a bit later for me. At age four, I was aware that I was alive. Uh, and that my mother loved me. I don't know that I was aware of much more than that. Um, but um, at uh, by around age eight or nine, I had this uh, sense that uh, uh, the uh, let's say other boys uh, uh, were behaving in in ways which I thought were strange, didn't make any sense to me. Why are they behaving like that? Come on! And then they like to chase the girls, and I was that. What do they do if they catch the girls? You know, I, 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 absolutely no clue. And I would run along with them and just hope that we didn't catch them. Uh, <laughs> we, we never did. They were they were fast. Uh, um, in England, I stayed in England till age ten, and uh, I, I liked to play in the girls' games. But I walked home with the boys. Uh, and I came to the USA, and I, uh, I just knew that uh, some of the male models didn't work for me. Uh, and, and you know, going back to that time, you know, there were, John Wayne was making all these cowboy films. That, uh, John Wayne, all this cowboy stuff, doesn't even speak correct English uh, in the films. I'm sure John Wayne, the actor, uh, could speak flawless English, but on the films, no. I've always thought that speaking cor uh, correctly in one's native language. Um, it, it's important, uh, and uh, and then there's this a fictional character, uh, Colonel Pickering uh, from My Fair Lady. Now that's the ideal male model for me, you know, genteel, polite, considerate of everybody, always trying to be agreeable. So Colonel Pickering, that that for me is the ideal male model, but you know that wasn't enough to to hold me into into what Karl Marx called a false consciousness. Uh, by age 13, I, I, I knew that this was a problem. And then I, I you see, I told you that uh, if it is easier for those who are attracted to men to go from male to female, I was attracted to, 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 to girls and women my whole life. And then I thought I was a woman, so I thought, it doesn't make sense. I, I mean, you could be a gay man, a lesbian woman, why didn't it make sense? because that's the way my brain happened to work. Uh, and then finally, for 20, after 27 years of this, at age 40, I said, what, what am I doing? It may not make, it may not, quote, make sense, unquote, but I, I, I've got to deal with it. And the point at which I, I decided I had to stop pretending to be male uh, was uh, uh, the point at which, uh, and which is just the whole thing fell out. There was one, one evening where I just went into the total crash, and suddenly I had uh, it, it's like I, I lost temporarily lost my inner self. I became like a vacuum inside, uh, and I knew I mean, I can't be a vacuum. Uh, so uh, at that point, I decided, okay, uh, I'm going to find a way forward. I consulted. Con consulted uh, with the physician, was put in touch with the people I needed to be in touch with, uh, therapy, support group, etc. So 
Und so geht es weiter. Und jetzt bin ich glücklich. Ich bin mit einer Frau verheiratet und ich wohne jetzt in Norwegen, das beste Land, vielleicht Nummer zwei. It might be the second best after Canada, I'm not sure. <laughs> I think we say it's a tie, Canada and Norway. Ah. Now, uh, Eivind Rindal can ask your question, and uh, Frida Rista Aune can get ready. Thank you very much. I have enjoyed this evening so far. And now it's, of course, I'm interested in the situation in Eastern Europe and also the, call it the links between very, very conservative Catholicism and nationalism and the way this alliance actually is quite bad for LGBT people in countries like Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, Slovakia and Hungary today. And, um, also the other side of this, because this, they are nationalists and populists. How does actually the people of Poland react to the pressure from the European Union to implement reform? We see other countries like Malta and Ireland has actually changed and implemented uh, equal marriage countries that used to be ranked as the most conservative of the Catholic countries, especially according to family issues. But what is the prospects for countries like Poland and Slovakia? And does actually the pressure from the European Union work? It's a complex question, but I guess someone in the panel has an opinion. Maybe all three of you has an opinion to this question or part of it. I'm looking forward to the answer. It's a very complex uh, question, but it's an important question, and I can try to give an, a partial answer. Um, what we see in Lithuania is that, you, that EU membership actually is quite important because the EU puts pressure on Lithuania when its laws are um, not within, within the limits, within the borders, of the um, uh, EU um, Traktat? Tra treaty, sorry. Uh, and we have seen at, at, at several occasions that this has been really efficient in Lithuania. But uh, what I also wanted to say is that the effect of civil society uh, coming together, uh, demanding pride, uh, going out uh, in the streets, um, despite the fact that there are 3,000, and some of them quite scary, uh, counter-demonstrators, um, first year uh, on the outskirts of the city of Vilnius, um, three years later in the city center with a lot of uh, hostility from the people who were watching the Pride, but last year, when the Baltic Pride went in Vilnius, it goes um, every third year in, uh, in, in Vilnius. Uh, last year, when it, uh, uh, the Baltic Pride went to the main city, the Godima, in Vilnius, there was a different atmosphere. People were actually applauding. There were maybe 50 counter demonstrators, which is uh, a very small number compared to what it was only six years previously. Um, the public attitudes are still quite bad. 50% of the population does not, um, uh, would not like to work together with an LGBT person, for example. 50% is uh, hostile towards um, uh, LGBT persons, but still you see the changes. So I do, I do think that uh, the EU has been a contribute, contributing uh, part of the process, but also the strong civil society movement who has uh, given the pressure from the ground. And I think that some of that has been seen in Poland as well. Um, it might lead to changes. Um, for Hungary, many of us are, are uh, quite concerned. 
the only thing that I'd, I'd maybe add from a personal perspective as someone who was born in Poland and, um, and whose family comes from there, uh, when, when, when I came out to my, my, my parents, uh, in, you know, jokes aside in terms of my, my mother's reaction, I think that my dad's reaction was one was, well, but we don't have gay people in Poland. Uh, like he didn't think that that was something that was, that was um, consistent. But you know, what was funny was that just coming out to him kind of made him, I think, think over the years, thinking back, well, which one of our relatives or friends might have been because of a certain way that they behaved or, or something like that. So I think that, 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 again, that goes to the whole point of, of being out at the individual level on the one hand, but also the importance of things such as pride. In Poland, uh, we now have uh, an openly gay mayor, uh, Robert Biedron, who's one of the, the, one of the highest profile uh, 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 Polish uh, opposition politicians, who's a mayor of a fairly large municipality. Uh, you have uh, effective pride parades and, and, and festivals in, in a number of cities. And, and this takes time. I think that, that this is the thing that I think we as, as, as society sometimes are impatient. We forget that it wasn't that long ago that, uh, that Norway and Canada were in precisely the same space. Uh, 30 years, for I know that seems like a lot to many of the people in this, in, in this uh, audience, it's not. It passes by very quickly. And I, I think that we have to have, as they say in sports, the long game uh, in, in terms of these types of rights, particularly in countries where culturally, religiously, uh, there are significant barriers to inclusion. Sabrina, do you have a short comment? Oh, I see, short. <laughs> hmm. I protest, io protesto. <laughs> oh, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, I was going to have comments on Poland, Hungary, and Bosnia, but we'll forget Bosnia then. Uh, on, on, on Poland, Poland is deeply, po deeply polarized society. Right now you have the PIS, the Law and Justice Party in power. And this party is uh, actually has actually been pushing for more conservative policies than the bishops of Poland like, and the bishops have been saying, "Hey, we we like like where you're going, but please don't go so fast on the issue of abortion." Uh, and um, there was, however, a transgender person, male to female, in in the Polish parliament, uh, the same as it's called. Uh, Robert Biedron, I think he's mayor of Slupshak, is that? Uh, I actually met him uh, on my, uh, uh, I think it was my first church tour uh, of Poland, so 2004. Uh, and uh, he, he had founded at that time uh, an organization called Campaign Against Homophobia. Uh, the main opposition party is, uh, in Poland is uh, probably still the civic platform. Uh, there are other opposition parties. Uh, and one of the ways in which we can see that there's resistance in Poland is that when the, the uh, uh, to peace, uh, PIS, is that when uh, uh, peace tried to pass these anti strong laws against abortion, banning all abortion, even when the mother's life was in danger from continued pregnancy, uh, for example, uh, thousands upon thousands of women dressed in black uh, went out in the streets of, of various Polish cities to protest, coming out in such strength that uh, uh, Beata Szydło, the prime minister, had to, to back away from it and say, okay, uh, we're not going to do this. Do you want me to say something about Hungary? I think we're going to move on to the next question, actually. <laughs> there are problems in Hungary, believe me, as Trump would say, believe me. Frida, Rista, Elne can now ask your questions, and then Martine Bjørnbakkenvangen can get ready. Hey, my name is uh, Frida, and I'm a member here, and this is my first time up here, so I'm a bit nervous. Uh, so I will try to be short, but uh, yeah. Uh, I think it's horrible to hear about uh, all these uh, uh, stories about uh, LGB people in, uh, in other countries. Uh, and also stories from Norway. And I, I feel like sometimes uh, the whole situation just feels hopeless. Uh, it feels like uh, so many people just uh, think um, uh, being gay or being um, trans or uh, is just um, 
it's part of a Western culture, uh, and I'm as a as a as a Norwegian. Uh, I'm I'm not sure how how I can deal with that. How I can um, uh, how I can help uh, the LGBT uh, population in other countries without be uh, becoming just another Western person that tries to. Um, imprint my opinions on other people's culture. Uh, this is a, it's something I struggle with, and I'm not sure how I, as uh, both uh, we as a uh, nation, uh, Western nation, uh, wealthy Western nation, and uh, we as I individuals. Repeat the last statement, please. I I just I'm I wondering I'm wondering what we as a wealthy uh, Western uh, nation and we as uh, individuals from uh, uh, wealthy Western. Um, a nation uh, can do to help uh, people, uh, the LGBT people in other countries, uh, without becoming uh, just another uh, Western culture that tries to imprint our opinion on other people. Yep. So, uh, well, thank you, for, thank you for that question. But, but first of all, let me say that by by being here and asking that question, you already are helping all of you by being here. Uh, are helping, but I do want to tackle one thing because it does drive me a little bit nuts. Is this this perspective that being uh, accommodating and tolerant of LGBT issues is a Western cultural thing? And I'll, I'll be fairly blunt: that is complete, utter bullshit. Um, I, it is not. Culture and religion are not rationalizations for the violation of fundamental human rights. That is just a, a, a non-starter for me. If you look at my culture, let, let's go to my culture. When I was going to school uh, in 1979, my culture was telling me that people like me should die, okay? And it was only by standing up, it was by constantly making ourselves visible and present in our various cultures that we can counter those kinds of, of perspectives. I don't buy for one second that being LGBT is a Western construct. It is a human condition that affects all of us. And we should not allow people to use excuses such as religion and culture to undermine our rights. Do not be shy about it. You are fully within your rights as, as, a, as an individual human being to speak out anytime you feel like it. And I'll be there championing you. Uh, Patricia? Um, I just completely support what Arthur is saying, and that is also the kind of the narrative that people in, for example, Russia meet, that uh, um, what you are is really not what you are, whom you love is really not whom you love. This is just uh, a Western-imposed idea, and that is basically taking from a person the right to be who he or she is and to love the person who he or she loves. Love is a human right, and that is in all countries all over the world. And to say that this right to love whom you love uh, is a Western concept uh, is going into the very negative narrative that, Mary, that many regimes impose on the LGBT movement and on LGBT uh, people. But I also want to answer on your question what you can do to, to help and to support. Uh, as Arthur was, was saying, it is by uh, being here. Uh, what you also can do is speaking out. You can speak out uh, in newspapers, in Norwegian newspapers. You can sign the petitions from Amnesty or from other organizations uh, to presidents and, um, and uh, leaders in other countries. For example, I'm certain that if there had not been international attention on the persecution of uh, gay and alleged gay men in Chechnya, it would have continued in a much worse scale. Uh, so, so that is an example. So, so there are ways to support LGBTI organizations in Norway. Uh, you can be a member even if you are not an LGBTI. Uh, LGBTI person yourself, you can participate in prides. Uh, so there are, there are a number of ways, and it is really simpor, uh, important. But the most important thing is to acknowledge that love is a human right. And sometimes I think that if you are a gay person in Chechnya, to believe for one moment that this person 
uh, just would do that because it was a Western idea. Because if you are belonging to a sexual or gender minority in a country or in uh, a republic like Chechnya, you know that your life is going to be an ordeal. And you don't do that just for fun. Thank you. Uh, I we'll can say something too. Then you have is, to keep it, it okay? really, really short. Mm. Only one sentence. <laughs> or we can move on to the next question. Where is, does one find the sexual minority status? In the culture or in the brain? It's in the brain. Thank you. Now we're going to have... I have more a, to say. The, <laughs> Now we're going to have the last question. Martine Björnbakken Wangen, you can now ask your question. Hi. Tingen er at jeg snakker norsk, og jeg er ikke så veldig god på engelsk. Er det noen som kan oversette for meg? I'm going to translate uh, as best okay. as I can. Fordi tingen er, jeg satt her veldig lenge og tenkte, nå skal jeg stille et spørsmål, og så følte jeg at det på en måte kom rett før meg. Uh, så kanskje vi allerede har fått svar på det. Men jeg, vil, jeg bare spør han sett, fordi jeg vil ha det sånn helt konkret da. Uh, og det her er kjempekult. Jeg synes det er dritkult at alle dere er her. Uh, og spørsmålet mitt er, vad kan jag konkret som människa göra här i Norge? Eh, kvinnor 22, jag bor i Norge. Vad kan jag göra för att stötta det här? För eh, bara sån generellt eh, jag ska på paraden och såna ting, men vad kan jag göra i livet för att visa att jag bryr mig? Det är er det jag lurer på. Okej. Okay. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to try to translate that, that. And what she was asking was, what can she do concretely to support the LGBT case, or this case, the Pride um, case? <laughs> right. Write articles, write books, research. Talk to people. Uh, there are scholarly outlets. Uh, there are uh, popular magazines. Uh, get the word out. Uh, this is, I think, one way. Uh, if you are invited onto a television program uh, to talk about this, such things, of course, this is also a venue. Uh, and giving public talks, you, you reach a certain audience. But what do we have here? About 200 people. If you go on television, maybe you reach 200,000 or something. So uh, television is a very p powerful medium. It's a simplifier, uh, but you can get simple messages out on television as well. Um, without being political in the capital P sense, uh, I, I believe that Norway is in an election. Um, <laughs> ask candidates how they feel about, uh, about these issues. Support those that have the same values as you do. Um, if, uh, if supporting LGBT rights is important at a global level, ask their spokespersons on foreign policy whether or not what they are going to do in, in government to support LGBT rights uh, around the world. Join organizations such as, such as Amnesty and volunteer your time. There's, there are lots of options from just being passive and supporting to being very active and engaged, whether it's in writing or volunteering with key organizations like Amnesty. Yeah, uh, it's a very good question. Um, I would also uh, encourage people to be a member of the Norwegian LGBTI organization called FRI. Uh, they are doing a lot of fantastic work nationally and internationally, and they have an international fund to support human rights uh, activists uh, at risk. Um, we, Amnesty, will also have a meeting next week, Thursday at 6 o'clock, and where was it? Literaturhuset, uh, where uh, you can meet um, one of the most greatest people I know uh, in, in the world. Uh, her name is Valentina Likosova. 
She comes from Maximum, the LGBTI organization in Murmansk, and she will tell about her work for LGBTI rights. And for her to experience a friendly atmosphere where people come and listen to her and support her, which is very, very different from the situation she faces in Russia, uh, that is important. She is an amazing spokesperson for LGBTI rights. Uh, she is in many ways at risk in the work that she is doing. So by coming, for example, to this meeting on Thursday and to similar meetings um, where you support those who are really facing danger and really facing challenges, that, uh, that is a very concrete and practical way to support. Thank you. <laughs> I want to say thank you to all of you who asked questions today and also thank you for the speakers we have with us today, Patricia, Arthur and Sabrina. Uh, give them a warm applause. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming here and speaking to us tonight. Um, now we're ready to move on to point 11, any other business. And the podium is now open to anyone who has something on their heart. Is there anyone who wish to speak here? Er det Storsal. Mitt navn det er Åsmund Forbeck Holst, og jeg er leder for FRI, Foreningen for kjønns- og seksualitetsmangfold, sitt fylkeslag her i Midt-Norge. Jeg ønsker kort å benytte denne anledningen til å rette en takk til styret og alle dere andre her på samfunnet for at dere setter dette tema på dagsorden. Takk for at dere inviterer viktige og dyktige innledere til å belyse Skjeves Levekår ute i resten av verden. Og takk for at dere hjelper til med å åpne øynene våre, for hvor viktig det er at vi fortsetter med den internasjonale kampen om like rettigheter for alle. Og takk for at dere videre denne uka inviterer til arrangementet som opplyser og som engasjerer, og hvor vi sammen kan holde gode samtaler og diskusjoner om vår kamp for et mangfoldig og likeverdig samfunn. Denne uka så samarbeider vi om å sette et viktig tema på dagsorden, og jeg ser frem til et godt og fruktbart samarbeid videre fremover. Takk. The Honourable Great Hall, my name is Tyler and I am a member. I'm also the president of ISFIT 19. And it's with great pride that I would like to present to you tonight the newest addition to our team, uh, including the new board members of ISFIT 19. I would like to uh, invite you all to welcome me, welcome, help me welcome them to the podium here tonight to introduce themselves to you. Everybody. My name is Thea and I'm a member of Samfne and I'm the new head of culture in ISFIT 19. Hello, my name is Elisa. I'm also a member and I'm the new head of Idea Exchange. Hello, I'm Evin. I'm also a member and I'm the new head of administration. Uh, I'm uh, My name is Ingeborg. I'm a member and I'm the new head of uh, Peace Prize. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Rebecca. I'm also a member uh, and I'm the new head of Communication. Hi, my name is Thomas and I'm a member and I'm the new head of Economy. Hello 
again. Uh, this time, very, very prosaic, very info just information about the Pride Festival. And um, there is a lot of interesting things happened in Trondheim the next week. We're starting already tomorrow by hosting three different um, events here at the Student Society, starting with showing a movie about how it is to combine a Muslim and a gay identity. Following that, we have a seminar on PrEP, the new medication against HIV. And after that, the um, film Klubben here at Samfuna is uh, showing the fabulous and humoristic and also quite touching movie Pride here. Further, uh, during the week, Patricia already told you about the first day event about Russia, but we also have a panel, this is maybe my little child in the Pride Festival this year, on combining identities, queer and Sami. And this is on Tuesday at six o'clock at Literaturusa. And for the English speakers, I would guarantee you this is an event also for you because we have someone from Finland in our panel. The discussions will be in English. <laughs> so you are all very welcome to join us for Pride. And sadly, I'm not actually to go in the parade, but I hope my colleagues in free and Tron and Pride will see all of the rest of you joining for the parade. Sadly, I had to work that day, earning money. As there don't seem to be any more speakers, we move on to point 12, critics of the meeting. Is there anyone wishing to say something here? Ærede Storsal, mitt navn er Ludvig, og jeg er medlem. Kunstnerisk innslag, det er et tradisjonelt punkt på samfunnsmøter, og noe jeg selv setter ganske stor pris på. Jeg merket at det uteble ved forrige samfunnsmøte, så derfor satte jeg stor pris på at vi fikk vakker sang fra Pikestrøm her i dag. Det synes jeg var fint. Men det fikk meg også til å tenke på at vi befinner oss i Storsalen på studentersamfunnet, og studentersamfunnet rommer intet mindre enn to damekor, to mannskor, et blandet kor, et teater, et promenadorkester, et salongorkester, et spillmannslag, et discoband, to storband og et symfoniorkester. Med fare for at jeg har glemt noen her. Så da synes jeg det virker litt pussig at ingen av disse kunne få lov å stille med semesterets, studieårets og det sittende styrets første kunstneriske innslag. Takk. Takk. Uh, as there doesn't seem to be any other speakers here. Uh, before we end this meeting, I would like to thank Patricia Cady, Sabrina Rame, Arthur Wilczynski, Trondheim Pride, Amnesty International, Styrets debattkomité, Forsterkerkomiteen, Reshi, Videokomiteen, Studentmedene, Markedsføringsengen, ITK, Rådet, Lørdagskomiteen, Fotoengen, Vaktene, as well as Café og Serveringssengen. And we hope you'll join us down in Strossa to continue the talk during political Nashville. The meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>